this lecture will review the approaches to the temporal bones as seen through the middle and posterior fossa and from laterally through the mastoid. We will begin with the approaches through the middle fossa. How many parts to temporal bone? Anyone? What part of temporal bone is this? Forms floor of middle fossa, lateral wall of middle fossa. Anyone? Squamosal part. Posteriorly is mastoid part, petrous part medially. Tympanic part here forms the back wall of the condylar fossa and the lower and anterior margin of the external canal. And the fifth part is the styloid part. We'll talk more about this tomorrow, but uh, all of you have had a little introduction to this. Uh, we're looking at floor of middle fossa. We feel the dura back to the petrous ridge. Where is the cochlea? B. Everyone. B. At B here, in back of the greater petrosal nerve, just distal to where it exits the geniculate ganglion. Now, cisternal, meatal, and then from fundus to geniculate ganglion, what segment of facial nerve? Labyrinthine. And distal to that is, is tympanic segment. Now, where are you going to drill if you're coming through the mastoid from lateral to open the superior vestibular area, the fundus of the meatus? Where do you drill? At A, we said they, all the canals, the three, have an ampulated and a non-ampulated end, and the ampulated end of the superior and lateral canal is anterior, and so when you drill through this area, you'll expose superior vestibular area when you're coming through the labyrinth. And inferior vestibular area, you're going to drill at the lower end of the posterior canal at D to expose inferior vestibular area. And the common cruise is going to be located at, at B here, where the back end of the superior and the up end of the posterior canal join. So as we look at middle fossa, medially you have trigeminal impression and then it rises up to a prominence that we call the trigeminal prominence and then it sinks down again into a depression above the internal acoustic meatus. We call this the meatal depression and then it rises up at the arcuate eminence, and lateral to the arcuate eminence is this paper-thin bone that we call the tegmen, and it roofs the external canal, the tympanic cavity, and the mastoid antrum all set below this paper-thin bone that is the most common side of spontaneous or post-mastoid leaks into the middle ear. And here we see the greater petrosal nerve and under it is the carotid artery. Usually the carotid lateral to the trigeminal nerve is covered by bone but in about 15% of cases, there will be a dehiscence of bone over the carotid artery lateral to the trigeminal nerve. So now we've drilled out the, uh, the middle fossa. We see the mastoid, the external canal, tympanic cavity, 
internal acoustic meatus and the area along the carotid. And is the cochlea going to set at A or B? It's going to be at B. So a way of thinking about this area is to think about it as what I call the rule of Y. External canal is one lamb, internal canal the second lamb, and the eustachian tube is the third lamb. And along this anterior lamb of the letter Y is this structure, which is the, anyone? in the roof of the eustachian tube, nestled up right against the carotid, separated from the carotid by a little thin shell of bone is the tensor tympani, innervated by the facial nerve. Yes? No. Five. Five innervates the tensor tympani. So you have tensor tympani, Eustachian tube, greater petrosal, and carotid all oriented along that anterior limb of the letter Y. Setting at the junction of the three limbs is the tympanic cavity, incus, malleus, stapes, here in the tympanic cavity, and then also wrapped around the these, the junction of the three limbs is the cochlea and the vestibule into which the semicircular canals open at this junction. So here we're looking at the junctional area, superior, lateral, posterior canal, tympanic cavity, tensor tympani, is cochlea going to be at A or B? It's going to be at B, and this is facial. This is superior vestibular, inferior vestibular. Uh, and here we see the cochlea. The basal turn sets in this cochlear angle the middle turn, the apical turn, comes forward under the greater petrosal nerve, is nestled right against the back of the tensor tympani. Uh, so, and coming through the middle fossa, you can drill out three approaches. One goes to the internal acoustic meatus that's hidden here behind the superior canal. The second comes through the petrous apex under the trigeminal nerve down to the side of the inferior petrosal sinus adjacent to where the sixth nerve passes through Dorello's canal. And when you're drilling medially through the petrous apex, it's easy to have spread of heat to the sixth nerve. I've seen a number of transient six nerve palsies from spread of heat to that nerve at the medial part of the anterior petrosectomy. The third approach through you, you can take through the middle fossa is an extended middle fossa approach where you can expose and drill out the labyrinth to get into the posterior fossa. So, here we're just looking now at uh, the facial nerve, geniculate ganglion, greater petrosal, cochlea setting in the cochlear angle, and behind is the vestibule into which the three canals open. And if you're going to the internal acoustic meatus through the middle fossa, the drilling is very tight at the fundus of the meatus. If you get a millimeter off target and drilling out over the labyrinthine segment, you get into the cochlea or the vestibule uh, and hearing is lost. And usually in these approaches, 
they're designed to preserve hearing. And here between the facial and superior vestibular is the Bill's Bar, the vertical crest named for Bill House who uh, introduced this middle fossa approach. Now, if you look at the area of the porous of the meatus, there's lots of room over the nerves at the porous. It's very tight at the fundus so that uh, when we drill out the internal acoustic meatus, we start today, well, in the past, they followed the greater petrosal to the labyrinthine segment, very tight drilling, easy to enter the cochlea, and then work toward the porous. But today we've learned it's best to work from the porous to the fundus of the meatus, that there's lots of room around the nerves back here below the Petrus Ridge, but here at the fundus, the geniculate ganglion is just below the floor of the middle fossa. Sometimes it's even exposed in the floor of the middle fossa, but to get to the nerves in the porous, there's quite a thickness of bone below the Petrus Ridge so that when you begin drilling at the Petrus Ridge, Above the porous, you have to go through a lot of bone to get down to the dura around the nerves at the porous, but then as you work toward the fundus to expose the meatus, you're coming progressively more superficial, and the labyrinthine segment is just below the floor of the middle fossa, so that if we look from the back at this temporal bone, what is this depression? Trigeminal, and this is trigeminal prominence. Meatal depression above the internal acoustic meatus. And then arcuate eminence. eminence. And this area is tegment. So at surgery, we're usually elevating this dura and looking at it upside down. And here we see the greater petrosal, Kawazi's triangle, trigeminal depression, uh, trigeminal prominence, meatal depression, arcuate eminence. But if you look at the external canal here and sight down it, that's going to be almost directly in a line with the internal acoustic meatus. The other way of citing <laughs> how to drill out the internal acoustic meatus is to take and create an angle between the greater petrosal and the arcuate eminence. That angle is usually about 120 degrees and then you bisect that angle and you lock the retractor on top of the Petrus Ridge and you begin drilling here above the porous, which is deep but wide with lots of rooms around the nerves to the fundus where if the nerve is going to be very superficial but the drilling is going to be very tight. 